But in 1943, Hattie, these things are still in the distant future. You're still a hard-working VAD nurse in Blitztorn, London. One of your greatest pleasures at this time is an occasional visit to the world-famous Players Theatre. Now, hearing that auditions are held every other Thursday at the Players, you pluck up your courage and apply to be heard. On the appointed day, clutching your collection of songs, uh, you walk nervously onto the stage and turn to the man who's to hear your audition. Ladies and gentlemen, your own, your very own, Hattie Jane! <laughs> the famous voice that has since introduced you to hundreds of audiences you know so well, celebrated actor and erstwhile chairman of the Players Theatre, Leonard Sachs! <laughs> Well, now, Leonard, all auditions are miserable, nervous affairs. Do you think that perhaps this is one we should draw a curtain over? Oh, no, I don't see why we should. I found exactly what I was looking for, and I, I couldn't believe my good fortune in having discovered it. You saw her, her quality at once, then? Well, I'd have been blind if I hadn't. You know, Hattie, I remember one very special detail about that audition. You came along in a white jumper with a great flaming dragon emblazoned across the front of Pat Schindler. Wasn't she at all nervous, Leonard? Yes, of course she was nervous, of course, but I was used to that. I got very used to listening to, oh, the little homemade talents that should have been reserved just for domesticity, but when Hattie started singing a little of what you fancy does you good, I relaxed and knew I was home and dry and sat back with a smile on my face. W were you able to offer her a job? Yes, the audition was on Thursday, and she went into the bill on the Monday night. I'd been looking for a long time for somebody to sing Mary Lloyd's songs, and I was delighted to have found her. <laughs> Just look at that screen behind you there. tell you she was an immediate success and she's gone on ever since from Indeed there. she has and thank you Leonard Sachs. <laughs> now the year 1950 sees you making your first important film, Chance of a Lifetime. during the making of that film, the director, who also co-starred, hired a professional welder to show you uh, how to handle those welding tools. But Hattie just waved the professional away. It was she who showed the rest of us how it should be done. Yes, I know you've recognized that voice, brilliant star of stage and screen, founder of London's Mermaid Theatre, Bernard Miles. <laughs> Bernard, as you say, it was Hattie who showed you how to use those welding tools. <coughs> well, that's right, yes, she did. <coughs> but she had done some welding before. <coughs> yeah, but, but oh, this is how she did, had had previous instruction then? In yes, way? indeed she had. I remember when she came to get the job and she sat on the chair facing me and uh, we settled a price because these things are always a matter of hard bargaining and I offered her what I thought was a very handsome fee for these uh, 17 days' work and she said, oh, I wouldn't care to accept that at all. And I said, but why not? She said, well, I, I, I've been in industry, you know. And I said, oh. And I said, what have you done in industry? She said, oh, I, I've been a welder. And I said, what on earth have you welded? And she said, oh, I spent part of the war years, she said, welding bailey bridges and pontoons. Well, it's quite clear that you can't offer an actress who's welded bailey bridges and pontoons the same as you would offer an ordinary actress. And so we had to really come up to her price, and I must say she was worth every penny of it and more because she's a, 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 a born actress very um, witty sensitive warm and with a lot of acting intelligence and should be used constantly 
in front of the cameras. And I hope that very soon, in fact, there is a play going off in the post tour very soon, and I hope we're going to be able to put her on the stage again in a beautiful play. Thank you, Bernard Miles. <laughs> Well, now, another very important event in your life, Hattie, in that same year, on November the 10th, 1950, to be precise, you married well-known actor John La Measure. <laughs> John, I understand, and I know that you're at double risk now, of course, but I understand that you were surprised that Hattie was on time at the wedding. Well, uh, I must confess, I am uh, rather inclined to be a bit surprised, you know, when, uh, when Hattie arrives for anything, really, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's purely because uh, the sort of a standing joke in our family, I, I'm one of these curious people who, uh, for some extraordinary reason, find it necessary to get to appointments and uh, rehearsals and things about half an hour too soon. There I am, sort of wandering about like an idiot, you see. <laughs> Nothing to do. And Hattie? Well, you see, she, uh, I would think, sort of uh, makes every moment, you see, uh, uh, count in some kind or another. Everything's terribly important when she's leaving the house or dragging out some rehearsal of some kind. There's so many things to be done, you know, ordinary, rather dreary, mundane things like shopping lists and uh, maybe a fuse has gone or... Uh, Oh, 101 things, but a cupboard even, for some unknown reason, might have to be turned out at the last moment. And <laughs> off she goes, you see, like a whirl into uh, rehearsals or uh, whatever it may be. And uh, how she manages to make it, I, I really wouldn't know, but she, she seems to. It would appear that she does. <laughs> so there's never a dull moment with Hattie, in fact. No, no, there isn't really. I would like, um, I would like to say that I... Uh, I am eternally grateful to the way she uh, runs the home, looks after the children, looks after me. The home comes first, really, I think I'm right in saying. <laughs> but uh, I think for somebody who is so busy all the time and so much in the public eye all the time, to do all these things is very difficult and a jolly neat trick. Thank you, John de Mercier. <laughs> Now, in November 1960, you received a letter sent by the man of number 10 mess on the aircraft carrier HMS Victorious. They had decided they wanted to be different. Instead of being adopted by a factory or a brewery, as is sometimes the case, these lads decided they wanted a mum. So they agreed that Hattie Jakes was the one person who was fitted to fill this bill, and this decision was unanimous. So we wrote and told her how we felt, and asked her to adopt us. Now you've never met before tonight, but one of those lads to continue the story, leading Seaman Rodney Conroy. <laughs> <laughs> Rodney, did Hattie agree to adopt you? Yes, she was delighted when uh, she agreed with us. Uh, she even sent us a couple of photographs and a photograph of her two children. Now, wasn't there some danger of you losing your newfound mum? Oh, yes, the officers, the officers they tried to make a takeover bed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they wanted, they wanted the, uh, how Hattie is, uh, you know, her mum for the whole squadron. But uh, we fought, and I'm glad to say we won. <laughs> but number 10 Mess has never had a chance to meet their adopted mum, did they, Rodney? No, no. Uh, every time we tried to make a, a meeting, a sort of family reunion, um, we were just sailing to the Far East or somewhere. And in April 62, well, the whole squadron, if you remember, disbanded. Well, nevertheless, we're going to have that meeting tonight. From all over Britain, here are some of your boys, Hattie. Petty Officer Hall. Oh. Petty Officer Bush. Petty Officer yeah. David. Yeah. Leading Seaman Hudson. Yeah. Leading yeah. Seaman yeah. Anderson. Yeah. Leading Seaman Hudson. Yeah. And leading Seaman yeah. Rumpy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for joining our program tonight. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.